Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship on this first Sunday of October. Give thanks to God that we have been gathered here in person and also continue to be gathered through our on, on, online means that have become available for us over the last six and a half months. Give thanks to God that this is possible and that we can gather together as a Creator Lutheran Church. For those of you who are here, we will be having communion at the end of our regular service. I stopped the Facebook live feed and keep the Zoom and we'll just change PowerPoint and then we'll move on into that. If some of you need to head off to watch a game that's on TV later today, or just this is a little bit extra of a risk. Just, it's very, very minimal compared to what we're doing, but you will be taking off your mask during that part. So if that's not something you're comfortable with or have other things you need to be doing, you may, you may leave and then we'll, as we set up, and then we'll have communion here in the sanctuary and on Zoom as well. Um, we also encourage that you hum during the hymns rather than sing, and that also in our, our common responses that we try to not project our voices but keep it quiet quieter also to eliminate some of the aerosols that go into the air for that as well. Um, the, the offering can be placed coming or going from the sanctuary. We do ask that once service is done, that you do go into the, the outside area if you're going to converse at all with any, with any other family units that happen to be here today. For those of you who are joining us from on Facebook, on Zoom, or watching later on our, on our YouTube channel, Give thanks for you as well. We do our best with the screen, but the light with the sun every week is a little bit different, and so you can always print up the bulletin and follow along that way as well. Other announcements from our life together. Next week, we will um, be having a congregational meeting following with the worship service. That will be a hybrid meeting, so those of you who are here present are asked to stay here and, and partake in that congregational meeting here in the sanctuary. Others, you can zoom on or zoom on into that meeting as well. So we will be navigating that. It is about our um, updating a, a long-term deferred maintenance uh, and replacement of our furnaces. So that is what we will be voting on and considering next Sunday. Um, church property cleanup next Saturday at 9. We'll be blowing off the roof, putting out moss, moss killer, and cleaning out the gutter starting at 9 a.m. So if those are tasks that you just can't wait to do, the reality is this is our home, this is our church together. And everybody pitching in and helping to make sure that our building and our church is, is in good condition um, for the years to come as well. And then just kind of looking into the future, October 15th, which is the third Thursday, we will be having uh, some time on our Theology on Taps with uh, PLU professor um, Merritt Trellstad to talk about uh, an ongoing discussion about racism. And if you'd like to prepare for that, you, there is some excerpts from um, Pastor Lenny Duncan's book, Dear Church, um, that are available in, from the office if you would like to read ahead. And also we will have our, our Bible presentation in the parking lot on the 18th after service. We'll do a, a drive-through scavenger hunt to give the, the, I think it's the second, what is it, Carrie, you right in here? The second, how old are they, second graders? Kindergarten. Kindergarten, second graders, and sixth graders. Um, their Bibles, or anybody who kind of have gotten missed in the last few years, We'll be having a, some stops in the parking lot and give those Bibles if that's part of our calling as a church. And also on the last Sunday this month, just so you all know, it won't be, um, there won't be a registration link for worship that Sunday because it is our confirmation Sunday. We have five youth that will be confirmed and actually two baptisms that day. So our in-person spaces are already claimed by those families. So everybody else in the congregation, we're asking you to attend worship that day via Zoom or Facebook or YouTube later. Um, it'll be an exciting day having two baptisms and five confirmations. And then uh, the next Sunday is All Saints Sunday. So you'll, we're starting to collect names of those, either members of the church or your family members that have passed this last year so that we can pray on November 1st, um, All Saints Day for, for all of them. I think those are our main announcements. Everything else can be found in 
your email, and if you don't have email and would like a copy of that, we have them available as well to take home. I think those are our main announcements, so let us prepare our hearts and our minds for worship. Please rise. We worship in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and one another. God of overflowing grace, we come to you with repentant hearts. Forgive us for the shallow thankfulness. Forgive us for passing by the wants and needs. Forgive us for setting our hopes on fleeting treasures. Forgive us for our neglect and thoughtlessness. Bring us home from the wilderness of sin and strengthen us to serve you in all that we do and say. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. By the grace of God in Christ Jesus, who gave himself up for all of us, your sins are forgiven and you are made free. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Rejoice with the angels and with one another. We have a Lord who makes and keeps promises to us. We are home in God's mercy now and forever. Amen. Our gathering song is Awesome God. first reading this morning is from Exodus chapter 12 and 13. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the tenth of this month they are to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. If the household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join its closest neighbor in obtaining one. The lamb should be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat of it. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a year old male. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the month. 
Then the whole assembled congregation of Israel shall slaughter it at twilight. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the low, two door posts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the lamb that same night. They shall eat it roasted over the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roast it over the fire with its head, legs, and inner organs. You shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. This is how you shall eat it. Your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals. On all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the hand of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, Consecrate to me all the firstborn. Whatever is the first to open the womb among the Israelites of human beings and animals is mine. Moses said to the people, Remember this day on which you came out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, because the Lord brought you out from there by strength of hand. No leavened bread shall be eaten. Today in the month of Abib you are going out. When the Lord brings you to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, which he swore to your ancestors to give you, a land flowing with milk and honey, you shall keep this observance in this month. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there shall be a festival to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten for seven days. No leavened bread shall be seen in your possession, and no leaven shall be seen among you in all your territory. You shall tell your child on that day, it is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. The word of the Lord. everyone. One of the hardest things to do these days is children's rooms because our connecting with children with you all is a challenge because of masks, because of facial expression, because of being present with you is so important. But our, our lesson today and, and what I'll be reading from the gospel to, a little bit in a little bit reminds us how why it's important to learn about why we do things. I mean, that, that lesson may be saying a little bit weird, strange about how to bake bread a certain way and how to prepare an animal so that you'd be safe. It's not something we normally talk about at church. But there are a lot of things that happen here that it's important that we learn about. Why do we gather in the sanctuary or at home for worship every Sunday? Well, it's because God wants us to have the, our ears opened up again and again to how much God loves us because we need that. Why do we have baptism? Well, because God commanded it. Jesus commanded that we do that so that we could become children of God and so that we could have the gifts of eternal life, but also God with us in our entire life. Why do we have communion? Why do we do that? Well, because on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he broke bread and gave the cup of salvation to the disciples, and he said, do this in remembrance of me. He commanded us to do it. Not just to, to have another thing to do, but because here in this meal, in, in bread and in wine, what we get is forgiveness. We get God's love and mercy. In fact, almost everything in our worship service comes directly from the Bible. 
When we say the holy, holy, holy a little bit later during the communion service, that is actually from the book of Revelation. The, when I say the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, that is from the Apostle Paul. What we do throughout our service is so that you hear as many times as possible that you're loved, that you're forgiven, and that God is with you. Again, again, and again. And those are very, very important things to do. What we're not always the best at is telling you kids and you big kids why we do these things. And sometimes it could easily be we're just doing it because mom or dad has said, or we've always done it that way, and we've never thought about it. Well, what, today, what we heard today that John read, and that I'll be preaching about in the sermon shortly, is why those things are important to learn about, so that they have meaning. So things, when things are hard like they are right now, we know where to go, and we know where to find hope, and we know where we're loved, and we know where God is with us. So that's why we do all the things we do at church, and if you ever have any questions about why, Please ask, because if I don't know, we can look it up. And some, some of the whys, it's because we like it that way, right? And that's okay, too. But those, the whys, because we like it that way, are the things we can actually change if we decide we don't like it that way anymore, right? But the other things, like baptism with water, or the Lord's Supper, or the fact that we preach, those are the things we won't change, because those are the very ways that God comes to us. The rest of it is just who we are as a people and where we live and what we like about music that gives us that message. So let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving us the church. And thank you for teaching us why it matters. And all God's children said, Amen. I'm going to try which mic is better here. Can you hear me from the lectern? Okay. Please rise in anticipation of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to Luke, the 22nd chapter, beginning with the 14th verse. When the hour came, Jesus took his place at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Then he took a loaf of bread, and when he said he, when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this of me. And he did the same with the cup after supper, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. In the last week, between our reading about Joseph's ark narrative, between being sold into slavery and then having his family reunited and forgiven, and thriving once again. We've now hit another few generations of time that has shifted and has changed. And the Pharaoh who knew Joseph has passed. And a new Pharaoh who, who did not remember or know Joseph has risen up. And instead of seeing and being thankful for works of the past, this Pharaoh sees a slave workforce that can build an empire. And he does not think highly of the Israelites. And so in the beginning of Exodus, we see Moses being placed in a basket and placed in a river. 
to save his life. And then a little bit while later, we see the daughter of the Pharaoh take Moses into the palace itself, showing us once again that when God has a plan, God accomplishes it. No matter what we can want to do as people to try to subvert that promise of God, it will be accomplished. Now Moses had been raised in the security and the stability of the palace, being the empowered people of Egypt at the time. And then he saw that his people, the Israelites, were being subjugated and were suffering. And he reacted in violence and then fled into Midian to escape um, his crime after witnessing all that injustice. And now in our story, we are at that point where Moses has been sent back to Egypt, the place where he probably didn't want to go. He had had a life now for about 40 years in the desert with Jethro and had a wife and had family and stability once again. And God was asking Moses to go back and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Now, when you think about it, it's rather um, wise of God to choose Moses because Moses is going to understand both cultures and both political regimes of the Israelites and the Egyptians. So he's a perfect person to choose for this. But it doesn't always, it didn't go so easily for anybody, did it? And these are the stories when, when, well, the first time Moses comes in and talks to Pharaoh, Pharaoh kind of decides he's not going to listen to it and make it even harder for the Israelites. And what he does is he says, well, they're going to have to make those bricks, but I'm not going to provide the straw for them anymore. I'm going to make it even harder. If this God of theirs wants to liberate them, he better show that he can do what he's saying, and I'm going to make his people suffer even more. I'm going to make Moses' people suffer. They must do as much labor as before, but with less resources. Such is slavery. Such is classism and casteism and the, all the isms that we have when we distinguish between people in such a way. So then God sends Moses after their lot gets worse now that he's there. And he says, okay, the next step you're going to do is now you're going to go to the Israelites and you're going to talk to them and tell them, guess what? God is here and God is going to liberate you from your captivity. Now, remember, they've been in slavery for about a generation at this point, and now their work has just gotten harder because Moses is on the scene. So they responded, of course, with rejoicing and hope, correct? Not at all. Their response was to not listen. And the writer of Exodus says, because their spirits were broken after so much time of cruel slavery, they couldn't even listen to a word of hope when it came. Couldn't believe it. But God remembered and God was doing something to change their situation. So then God sends Moses to Pharaoh. And Moses asks a very good question. Why would Pharaoh listen to me if the Israelites didn't listen to me? And the key in this exchange back and forth is it's not belief or disbelief that leads to the exodus, or to our salvation for that matter. It's God's action that creates hope. It's God's action that creates freedom. It's God's action that creates and opens possibility in the midst of hardship, in the midst of despair, in the midst of broken and weary spirits. God comes and changes. And we are called in our readings today to remember that. We have a God who acts. We have a God who is present. And then what, what transpires is a 2020 worth of plagues for the Egyptians. I mean, we're, I think we're approaching it right now. There's some apocalyptic bingo going around out there on the internet of like, you know, we had we got COVID, we had murder hornets, we had fires, we've had flooding. What else do we have happen this year? Right? 
So we feel a little bit what maybe they felt with, with all these plagues. And you know, I grew up thinking that they were kind of cute little plagues. Oh, what's next? You know, turning water into blood, the Nile River becoming blood, and then frogs, and then gnats, and then flies. It kind of felt like, you know, the Prince of Egypt movie of let's kind of just imagine little frogs hopping around and it's gotta be a little funny, right? Until you've lived through plagues yourself and you start to realize how horrible this must have really been. And the first two plagues, the magi magician, um, magicians of the pharaoh could replicate it. They could also turn water into blood and they also could create frogs out of, I don't know where. But then the interesting piece is twofold here. For one, the Israelites also suffered from these plagues. When the water turned blood, it stunk. And the fish died in the Nile River. That impacted everyone. And when the frogs finally died and they were swept up into heaps, as the Bible says, they also started to stink. Plagues, no matter what, impact everybody. Disproportionately, as we're learning even with COVID-19, but when it impacts one person in a community, it ends up impacting everyone. The rest of the plagues, after the first two, the magicians of the Pharaoh couldn't actually replicate. The gnats and the flies and the livestock being diseased. And that one, only the Egyptian livestock was diseased. Though the Israelites were living in Goshen at the time, and they, their livestock was untouched, which actually impacted Pharaoh not wanting to let them go because they were the only ones with any livestock left. Why would he not only lose his labor force, but also lose the herds that they would need to recover? Then came boils, then came thunder and hail, and that's another interesting one because a warning was given to everyone to bring your livestock inside. If you stay outside, if they stay outside, they will die. If you listen to the word of the Lord in this warning, they will live, those who, have left, who are still alive. And guess what? Just like some of us, some people heeded the warning and some people did not. It's like we don't learn our lessons. If this has been happening since the 2020 worth of plagues in the Pharaoh, time of Pharaoh, we're not learning much about it now either. And then came locusts, and then came darkness. And I want to let you know that there's a cycle developing through all of these plagues that come. Moses goes to the Pharaoh and says, let my people go. And the Pharaoh, of course, says, no, I'm not going to do it. And then Moses says, okay, now comes a plague of whatever's next on the list. And then Pharaoh goes, well, this isn't very much fun. I need this to stop. I've obviously been sinful, and I haven't listened. And he actually uses the word sinful. Please make it stop. Moses, pray to your God to make it stop. And then Moses prays, and there's a reprieve. And as soon as there's a reprieve from what was struggle, they were struggling with, what do you think happened? Change of heart? Not at all. It's like, oh, we're free for a while. Let's just go and do what we want. And then all of a sudden, return to the previous behavior, and another plague comes. It's like Pharaoh couldn't learn. You know, lest we think that Pharaoh or those in charge of countries or, or cities or states are worse sinners than all of us, I just want to point out this. Our leaders' sins are more visible to us. They're in the paper all the time. And they impact more people. It's the burden of leadership. Your decisions impact a lot, a lot of people. But that cycle of things being hard because of your actions and then praying and having a reprieve and then like, okay, I'll just go back to my old sin and my old pattern, that's all of us. And the impact, however, is a different scale. But I would actually say that sometimes it's more devastating when you and I sin. Because when you and I hurt our husbands and our wives and our children and our parents, that betrayal is so personal. It goes to the core and it can shake us in a way that other things can't. You see, 2020's biggest plague 
is the one that's been with around with us since Adam and Eve. And that's of sin. That's of our selfishness. That's of us not having a continual change of heart and following again and again into the patterns that destroy and divide that aren't thankful for God and that have deep and real consequences on the world, depending on our situation of leadership or in our family or on our lives. Today's reading from Exodus gets to the de details of one particular night that broke the cycle of sin and, and claiming they want help, getting help, and then going back. The tenth plague broke the cycle because it broke Pharaoh. And that tenth plague was one that passed over the Israelites as they prepared. They prepared bread of haste. They put blood on their doorstep, doorposts, as they waited for the angel of death to come through their towns and their villages and their country to take one child from every home that had it prepared. The devastation of this plague needs to be felt, I think. When have you waited for devastation to come in your life? When have you had that suitcase packed, not knowing, for instance, if the fire was going to blow your direction or not? When have you had a big earthquake and wondered when the next aftershock would come and you're just on, on point worried and anxious about what is going to happen next? Or how about now in 2020 when those contact tracing calls come and you find out you've been exposed, but you don't yet know if you have COVID-19 or not? Those moments when you are prepared and you have a way forward, you have a God that says, I'm here, and yet you're wondering what's going to happen in the morning. What's the next phone call you're going to receive? Are you going to get the knock on the door, as we had in, in September, to say you need to leave your house in the next 15 minutes? We are in a place this year where I think we understand the story in ways we've never understood it before. That one house could lose somebody and the next house ends up being fine. And where God's word comes into that. In fact, death came that night into every Egyptian home. And God wanted Israel to remember about God's act to free them. And also God's promise to them from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And how God is faithful. And how death passed over them that night. There's a lot to struggle with this in this text, and we can have conversations for the rest of my time with y'all, right? Which is hopefully, God willing, a very long time. We have a lot in Scripture to struggle with and to mourn with and to, to, to just wonder how God works. But that speculation is not going to get us very far because what we have is also promise. And that this is ultimately for the sake of the world. It's not good to subjugate an entire people into slavery. That needed to stop. And Pharaoh was given ample opportunity to stop it, and he didn't. He kept it going. So remember that we are to remember this story so that we remember it's not just empty ritual we're asked to do. So we're not just going through the motion, but we remember we have a God that acts. And we have a God whose justice is not necessarily our own justice, but a God who ultimately wants to sustain life and to provide life eternal for all of us. After all, that other word, when we hear, heard remember in our lessons today, was the night Christ was betrayed. The night Christ died the night before Christ died for us. The firstborn son of God incarnate died as well. We, like Pharaoh, like Israel, are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We are so beaten down and overwhelmed and our spirits are broken, or we place our hope in things that are not enduring. 
So Christ brought promise into the midst of our lives, not by passing over death, but by dying so that we need not fear. Even in 2020, when it's like, what's going to happen next? And sometimes those bingo games are fun and sometimes they're just depressing. Unless like the bingo slot that says Christ's second coming happens, that can be kind of exciting. Of finally being fully in Christ's presence. But I'm not ready for that either. Our remembrance at communion is not just a nostalgic reminiscent of what God did and acted on 2,000 years ago. We do communion. Because Christ did something new there. Christ did something for us. Something only Christ could do. So we not only remember that it's a great story, but we also receive once again freedom. We receive once again a break in the cycle of our sin. Of our loops of fear and worry and broken sin is broken by Christ's death and resurrection for us. In the midst of waiting for devastation, we are freed and fed and nourished. Our bodies, but also our spirits, our whole being is renewed by God in the word that we receive and also in the meal that we are given. 2020 is still happening. There's a few months left, and I'm kind of suspecting 2021, at least part of it's going to be a lot of the same. That's part of the plague we are in. We don't know when it's going to end. Our president has COVID-19 right now. We are praying as a nation for him and for the 209,000 people who have already died in our country alone from COVID-19. We are shaken. And we are also not abandoned by God. So we remember a promise. A promise of what Christ did. And that promise is then distributed to you in the word that you hear, that opens your ears even when you're weary, and gives you new hearts, and also in your hands so you can hold it. So you can feel it, so you can taste it, because God knows that in times like this, we need that. So God gives it. Gives it for you. Because you are known, and you are beloved, and you are free by God now and forever. In the midst of it all, Christ comes for you. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.
Let us confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and all according to our needs. giving us life, giving us forgiveness, giving us hope. In the midst of this year marked with challenges, marked with challenges that we don't know the end of, remind us of your love, remind us that you are here, and remind us that you are our God who is acting in our lives and in our world even now even when we might not be able to see it. May you remind us, whispering into our ears, that we are beloved, that we are forgiven, and that you are with us. Lord, in your mercy. Hear Lord, we lift up to you all those who are suffering from COVID-19 and whose families have been impacted as well. We pray for the 209,000 who have died in the United States and the additional people who have died throughout the world. We ask you to be with those who currently suffer from this virus. We lift up especially President Trump and our First Lady at this time. May you be with them and all who are suffering from this virus today. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord, we also ask you to be with others who are suffering in other ways, who are suffering from cancer or other health and healing issues that are needed. We lift before you now those who are on our hearts this day. Be at work in their lives, Lord. Be with their care teams and their families. Be in their bodies, restoring them. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Lord, we lift up Creator Lutheran Church and Preschool. We give thanks for the ministry that you have placed in our hands, and we ask you to continue to guide us forward. Be with us as a people of God and Open our mouths to share your story, your present presence with the people in our lives as well. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Before I release you all, what we do in the in-person worship for, for peace is you may turn around and look people in the eyes and say, peace be with you. Please share that peace of the Lord with one another. And I invite you to be seated. This is our time and service where we say thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness. 
in supporting the mission and ministry of Creator Lutheran Church by sending in your offerings. There are several ways to send in your offerings. Um, you can come into in-person worship. You can also um, use our Give Plus app or our website. You can mail your gift in or you can directly give from your bank accounts. All of those will ensure that we have a vital um, ministry here, not just now, but into the future. So thank you for your faithfulness and help us catch up a little bit as well if you're able after the summer and the reality of COVID, we're a little behind and we'd, we'd like to just be able to have a vibrancy moving forward that we already are gifted and blessed with. So let us pray together the offering prayer. Let us pray. God of life, you give us these gifts of the earth, these resources of our life and our labor. Take them offered in great thanksgiving and use them for the good of your creation and the work of the kingdom of God through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us pray together the prayer our Lord taught us. Our Father, Abigail, we can listen to, we can listen to Let Us Towns and Tongues Employ. Mm -hmm. 